Am I audible? Better? Very good. Thank you very much for coming today. And as is the sacred month of Karthik, uh, I'll talk today about a song that we sing daily during this month of Karthik, which is that? Damodar Ashtakam. So I'm actually taking a eight part series on the Damodar Ashtakam, one on each verse. I'm taking it in different parts of the America. But today I'll speak on the fourth verse. Of course, each class is, is self-contained in itself. So how we will do it is, we will recite each line. Do you do we have sheets or most of you know the Damodar Ashtakam? So we will just, uh, yeah. you have phones. Yeah, you have phones, so you can have it. So the Damodar Ashtakam is one of the most beautiful poetic compositions that glorify Krishna. And the idea is that we all are looking for happiness. And there are different ways in which we all can find happiness. What the... We just want to give put the mala. Okay. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So we are all looking for happiness and there are different kinds of happiness in the world and what the bhakti tradition tells us is the highest happiness is when we connect with the highest source of happiness just like if we have a if it's hot and you have a small fan then sometimes there are like a small baby fan is there it can use a little air there's a bigger fan, it can give us more air. Sometimes there's a huge fan. Sometimes maybe a half a dozen people can stand under the fan and all of them can get cool by that. So the, if we want to feel cool, the bigger the fan, the greater the source of greater it is the source of cool air. So similarly, when we are looking for happiness in the world, then there are many sources of happiness. But if we can connect with the greatest source of happiness, we get the greatest happiness. So this verse describes uh, how we can connect with that supreme source of happiness. So God is infinite. And infinite means that he also has infinite happiness within him. Satyam anantam param sukham. The Upanishads say that is the unlimited eternal reality who is the source of all happiness. So the Damodara Ashtakam describes the pastime of Krishna wherein Krishna becomes bound. So, so this is a very sweet and endearing vision of divinity. God has two aspects to him, his greatness and his sweetness. When we come to know how great someone is, then that creates some submission. Say, if we are having some discussion or argument with someone about something. And then, maybe we, we come to know that person has actually a PhD and has studied 30 years in that subject. Oh, if they are an authority, then naturally that creates some submission. So, understanding God's greatness creates submission towards Him. But, a personal relationship is based not just on submission. Need to take it there? Just one way. Yeah, sure. Okay, usually I ask whether I'm audible. So, let me know if once it resumes whether I'm audible or not. So, let's recite this line till then. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So, am I better audible now to everyone? Okay, thank you. So, if we want a personal relationship with someone, it's not just their greatness. If we appreciate someone's greatness, we might become their fan. But a fan doesn't have really a personal relationship with their hero. If there is a distant admiration. If you want a personal relationship, it's based not just on appreciating that person's greatness, 
but also their sweetness so the bhakti tradition reveals how the ultimate reality is supremely sweet krishna is god but in this past time of damodar he becomes so conquered by his devotees love that he becomes bound by that and god is the supreme conqueror he cannot be conquered by anyone at all but just like somebody might be a champion boxer and they might be so powerful that any competitor is one punch and a powerful opponent is knocked out and yet this champion boxer might have a might have a son or a nephew or a grandson and then they say let's wrestle and while they're wrestling then this small child just punches ah, and boxer falls down i defeated you i defeated i defeated you now nobody can defeat that person but out of love the champion boxer acts as if they are defeated and that is endearing in its own way so krishna is the supreme lord he cannot be be controlled by anyone conquered by anyone but krishna is bound by mother yashoda sthita graivam damodaram bhakti baddham he is bound by devotion and this vision of god as such a all attractive all loving person is so so endearing that satyavrat muni in this composition is now asking for a benediction there are eight verses in the damodar ashtakam as the name ashtaka itself suggests so the first two verses you could say describe the past time how krishna tries to run away and is caught and is bound then the remaining verses are first there is the narration of the past time and then there is exposition based on the past time is the analysis what is actually going on over here the third verse says that this past time is so ecstatic the devotees ananda kunde they get inundated in pools of ecstasy and in the fourth verse is, is a meditation on what to ask the lord what can we pray to him so let's recite those of you who have we'll recite one line and we'll discuss the meaning and then we'll recite it again varam deva moksham na moksha vadhim va गिवर ऑफ बेनेडिक्श इन जनरल मोस्ट पीपल दे डोंट थिंक अबाउट गॉड श्री प्रभुपाद राइट इन वन ऑफ इज बुक्स ऑन द वे टू कृष्ण that all knowledge comes from god but all knowledge doesn't begin with god begin from god what it means is that ultimately the insight the inspiration that we get there have a divine source but it is not that one day suddenly a person wakes up and start thinking about god it is we look at the world around us and either the things in the world or the events in the world events involve people people in the world they prompt us to think about god so you might look at a beautiful sky on a starlit night you ask when you think where did all this come from that's happens with some people more often than not for all of us it is when we are trying to do something in life and after some time we realize that hey i am not able to do this getting the getting this thing done getting this desire fulfilled is not in my power alone that is the time we start thinking about some higher reality some higher reality maybe there is someone out there i had a friend in my college he was an atheist and we used to have quite a vibrant discussions 
and eventually he, I, I became a monk a brahmachari and after 20 and recently after 20 25 years he called me and he said i want to do a puja i said what happened did you have a change of heart he says what happened i said no 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 he, says, he was a software engineer he says i'm start i'm starting my own uh, startup and he says, in case God exists, I don't want him to create any trouble for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> he says, I'm taking insurance. I'll have this kind of insurance also. <laughs> so, usually for us, we don't think of God directly. When we function in the world, there are some things in our control and many things not in our control. And then we start thinking, maybe the things that are not in my control, are they under someone's control? And maybe if they are in someone's control, maybe that person, if I please them, if I appease that person, then that person will make things work out well for me. So, that's, uh, it's not suddenly we think about God. We think about the world and based on that, our thoughts may go to someone who is beyond. And usually, when we think about God, it is for the purpose of what he can do for us. It is. Most people, uh, they are not interested in God per se. In the biblical tradition, in, in, in the Bible, there is the prayer, Oh Father, hallowed be thy name, give us our daily bread. Ashila Prabhupada would say that it's good that people are going to God and praying, but this prayer shows their love for bread, not love for God. <laughs> and if bread can be God by other means, then what is the need for God? And that's what is happening. In the Western world especially, most people are not worried about their bread. They're, they may be worried about their butter. <laughs> but so uh, most people feel, I don't need God. In like fact, one of the fastest growing, uh, you could say, religious denominations is what is called as nuns. Means which religion do you belong to? None. I just don't care about it. Because they feel God is irrelevant for them. I was in London and I was giving a talk. Does God exist? So the, the organizers told me that this topic is not very relevant for people. I said, then what do I say? If God exists, so what? So, how is it relevant to me? So, when our, our power to get the things that we want increases, then we feel, why do I need some divine power? But, but nowadays, many people turn to God because of some other reason. I was in Australia and uh, there was an interfaith discussion and the topic was, why has God not died till now? <laughs> now, what does it mean? Why has God not died till now? The idea is that there, there are, since the last 150 years, there have been thinkers who have been predicting the death of God. Friedrich Nietzsche was a prominent German philosopher and he said famously, God is dead. What he meant was that, that the the basis for belief in an idea like God has been destroyed by the advancement of science. And that's why nobody can believe in God. And that's what many thinkers are thinking that, many materialistic idealistic thinkers that God, that as science advances, as technology advances, people will reject God. But that has not happened the way they expected. It seems religion has tremendous staying power. It has tremendous resilience. America is among the world's more, most Western, the Western world among the most religious countries. There is a resurgence of religion in Russia after the, after the fall of communism. India is very religious. The Middle East, of course, is religious. So it's a, so why is this happening? So the reason is that nowadays, especially in the Western world, God is not presented, especially by the Christians, as a cosmic supplier. Because cosmic supplier will give you your bread. 
But nowadays, God is presented as a cosmic therapist. Oh, you go to God, you will become peaceful. Your agitation, your anxiety, all of it will go away. You will become peaceful. And with everything that we have, even with our big, big technology, it's not easy to get peace. And that's why what happens is the people are agitated and then they want some relief. So basically the point I'm making is that we are interested, we are interested not so much in God, but in what God gives us. And that's why whenever people talk about God, they talk about some benediction. Oh God, what will you give me? So in this prayer, Satyavrat Muni is saying, what is it that I want? He says, Varam Deva, oh Lord, you are the giver of benedictions. And you may give this, you may give that. And Varam Deva Moksham. Now there are different degrees of desires also. So most people desire something in the world. Maybe, oh, maybe give me a, give me this car or give me this, give me that, give me that. So me, it's like a, you could have a laundry list. For many people, you know, religion is a cheaper substitute for shopping. <laughs> I have to go and shop, just go and tell God. In this vision of religion, what happens? It's a very commercialized idea, business idea. God, I'll do this for you and you do this for me. And when this idea is there, it becomes very utilitarian. Once a person, he took a, bought a lottery and it was for, it was for $1 million. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh God, uh, if I win this lottery, I will, I will donate half of it to you. Mm -hmm. And then he waited and waited and then the it was after one week the result was going to come and the result came and he, he was a winner. He was elated. Yes, I won. And then he stopped and looked. Actually, he had got the second prize. So he had won how much? Half of it. Half a million. And he thought about it and he went to the temple and he said, Oh God. You are so clever. You took your share beforehand. <laughs> so, what happens here? That just as in business, people try to give the least and get the most. So, we might do something like that with the religion also. So, when we see God as the giver of desirables, then it is the desirables that interest us. Not the giver, but a spiritual advancement to grow spiritually means to gradually understand that God is God is the giver of desirables, but also God is the supreme desirable. He is the supreme desirable. If we can become attracted to Him, become absorbed in Him. That is the supreme happiness. So different people have different kinds of desires. That some people have this desire that oh I want this, I want that. But some people understand gradually that this whole business of fulfilling desires never brings fulfillment. I fulfill this desire and then uh, the desires are like a hydra-headed monster. You know, one desire is fulfilled and ten desires come out. <coughs> And then 10 more desires come up. And then somebody might say, I just want freedom from all desires. So that is moksha. Moksha is a state when we are liberated from material existence. We can get some idea of moksha. Say like somebody wants to maybe have a, maybe they are very poor and they can't afford it. They want to drink, but they don't, can't even afford a drink. And then they get a drink. And they get another drink and they get another drink and somehow they earn money also they can spend it but they become alcoholics after that instead of alcoholism what happens first the drinker takes a drink then the drink takes a drink and then the drink takes the drinker 
so it's a snowball effect so eventually somebody becomes an alcoholic then they may say initially their desire was i just want enough money to get one more drink one more drink one more drink but when they become addicted then they realize i just i just want to be free from this desire i don't want the desire to drink also so that is indicative of the desire for liberation sometimes we have we want the freedom for fulfilling our desires and so there are two kinds of freedom one is we are free for desires and the other is we are free from desires free for desires means somebody will say oh you should not drink we may have parents who tell us don't drink or we may have our social cultural religious rules which may be restrict a particular activity we say i want to be free from all this and i want to enjoy that's one kind of freedom it may be financial freedom cultural freedom but actually that freedom leads to entanglement because we get attached but then there is another kind of freedom where not free for desires but free from desires and yaga shanti manantaram that state is a state of peace as so i imagine two people are going this is their they're staying together at a place maybe in a hostel or something like that and this is their workplace and in between there is a bar now one of them has never drunk and has no inclination to drink the other person has drunk repeatedly and the desire keeps tormenting them and the first person goes by they may not even notice the bar along the way other person gets i want to drink no i can't drink i don't want to i want to i won't want to there's so much torment so freedom from desire is a big relief so that is often desired by some people and that is called as moksha moksha is freedom from the desires that bind us to this world and then when we are freed like this then we get liberated from the world and many people who are serious spiritual seekers they seek liberation they seek moksha it's uh, it requires some amount of maturity even to recognize that we are bound just like if somebody is a little drunk then they realize hey uh, uh, maybe they drank a little bit in the bar i cannot drive you know they say means you can drive or maybe i'll go in a cab or something like that when a person little drunk they are aware but if a person is very drunk and somebody tells them, don't you shouldn't drive how oh, is that i should not drive eh? <laughs> <laughs> so if somebody is too drunk they don't even understand that they are drunk just similarly we are all bound but if we are too bound then we don't even realize we are bound so it requires a little little decrease in intoxication to understand that i am intoxicated uh, if it is heavily intoxicated then they don't understand that so most people are so intoxicated by the hope of worldly pleasures that they only ask god for many desirables give me this give me that give me that but people who become a little elevated and satyavrat muni the sage who is composing this is a elevated sage so they they don't ask god for various desirables they ask god for freedom from desire and but he is saying i don't want that varam devo moksham na i don't want that oh lord then is there something higher so there are basically you could say two 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 worlds there is the material world and there is the spiritual world there is a material level of reality and a spiritual level of reality so you could envision this as a negative axis and a positive axis so negative axis is where the all the worldly desires drag and drive us and liberation is like the zero point where we are free from desires now that as i said the freedom from desires can give us relief but itself it doesn't give much joy why is that because that is based on a misdiagnosis suppose somebody has got arthritis and any movement of the body causes them pain they just move their ah this move ah this ah, constant pain then they may think i just want to stop moving they 
can just stop moving, I'll be free from pain. Now, it's too. Firstly, it's very difficult to stop moving. And if they stop moving, they will become free from pain. But what after that? After that, they'll want to move. The pain is apparently caused by the motion. But actually it is caused by the disease. When the disease is removed, they can move and they can feel, they'll feel no pain. In fact, they can move and do things. And they do constructive things and can give joy. So it's based on a misdiagnosis. The pain is caused not by the motion, but by the disease. And when somebody wants to just stop motion to be free from pain, that's a misdiagnosis. So similarly, the bhakti tradition tells us that to think that desires entangle me. And therefore, I just want to be free from desires. That's a misdiagnosis. Desires are not the problem. Misdirected desires are the problem. To be conscious is to be desirous. Each one of us is a conscious being. And consciousness means... We observe, we experience, we analyze, and then naturally we desire. This is good. This is not so good. So we can't kill desires. We can't get rid of desires. In fact, to want to get rid of desires is also a desire. Isn't it? It's like, so to say, I, I want to give up all desires. It's a it's a self-contradictory statement. It's like somebody says, I don't know a single word of English. Uh, what's wrong? He already spoke seven words of English. Isn't it? <laughs> so to say, I want to be free from all desires. Well, that's already want means a desire. So we can't actually be free from desires. So that's why Moksha Vadhim. Avadhi means something bigger than Moksha. Varam Deva Moksha Na Moksha Vadhim Va. What is higher than liberation? They said there's the negative axis, there's the positive axis. Then the material world and the spiritual world. The spiritual world is where we eternally belong. And in the spiritual world, the devotee and the Lord live together in an eternal bond of ecstasy. And that is what we all long for. Actually, if we just, if we, have, if we went back maybe 150, 200 years into the past, whether it was India or whether it was the Middle East, whether it was Russia or whether it was America, whether it was Europe, everywhere people had this understanding that this world is a, is a place of transition. This world is not the ultimate destination. By living in this world, we are meant to go to another world. And that world is life's ultimate purpose. However, in the last 150-200 years, with the advancement of science and technology, people rejected this idea of a spiritual paradise. And they replaced it with the dream of a technological paradise. So we all want a better world, a better life. And the world's theistic traditions told us there is a better world. And we can by purification and devotion attain that world. Now today technology has in many ways created a lot of comforts. But definitely those comforts have not created paradise. Paradise is not a place where people will be depressed. People will be worried. People will be suicidal. And that has increased enormously in today's world. So something is seriously wrong. So there is the hope for a better world which is always there that is fulfilled by rising to the spiritual level. So moksha vadhim means that, okay, there is this negative axis, there is zero, and there is a positive axis. So it says that I don't want to go to the spiritual world also. This is strange. Moksha Vadhi is right, going to the spiritual world. Why, why do you want that? So, the spiritual world is not just a location. 
sometimes some of you may have seen some maybe the shrimad bhagavatam or some other with the the, the the universe is depicted as a as a diagram and then we might get this idea that okay this is the material world and this is the spiritual world it's like say so this is america and this is canada hmm? so the spiritual world is not just at a different location it is at a different level of reality it is a different level of consciousness to go there it is not just a matter of physical transforming transportation it is a matter of elevation of consciousness what makes the spiritual world special is not just the location like some places say here we are not very far from hawaii or the cal this california there are some places which are extremely beautiful and that location itself is special so the spiritual world is not just a place it's not a matter of location it's a matter of dis, it's a matter of disposition it's we need to have the right consciousness what is that consciousness that consciousness is actually attraction to the person who presides in the spiritual world that is god krishna when we have love for krishna and with that love for krishna when we go to the spiritual world and there is everybody else who is devoted to krishna and there is great joy over there eh somehow we could go to the spiritual world and then we uh, go to the spiritual world and then we ask you know okay what happened about the impeachment or mm-hmm. uh, who won the elections what is the cricket score what are the stock market prices well nobody would be interested in that and we would get bored over there so going to the spiritual world is a matter of developing the consciousness it's a matter of developing devotion to the lord and that lord so this is the material world this is the spiritual world so we go to the spiritual world not just by physical transportation but by emotional redirection by redirecting our emotions from the world to the source of the world to the lord and that very lord is present in this world krishna when he descends to this world the word avatar means one who descends avatariti the avatar so when he descends to this world then he is saying why do i need to go to the spiritual world varam deva moksha na moksha vadhimva na chanyam rudeham varesha dapi in the spiritual world one may have different uh, specific desires i want to relate with the lord in this way or that way he says i don't want any of this varesha dapi to that twice he asserts it is not that he has some doubts whether the God, whether the lord can fulfill the benediction or not sometimes we may want some help we may go to a bank and apply for some loan but if it's a small bank we may think this bank will say doesn't have so much loan to give to me so <laughs> so it's not like that he twice asserts varam deva you are the giver of benediction and then also he says varishad among all those who can give benedictions you are the greatest and yet i do not want these benedictions from you so there is you could say a build up i don't want this i don't want this i don't want this then what do you want that will be described in the next verse so let's recite this verse once again and then we'll go to the next verse varam deva moksham na moksha vadhimva फॉर्म देर इज अ there is a figure of speech in english called as oxymoron oxymoron is where two opposite ideas are brought together suppose somebody tells us something and that is that was brilliantly stupid <laughs> what is it brilliant or is it stupid is it brilliantly stupid so two ideas come together suicide it is said is a act of courageous cowardies <laughs> why courageous cowardies 
sometimes people plan <coughs> to commit suicide mm -hmm. say somebody is like i'm going to lie down on the path of a train and then let the train go over my body i'm going to end my life and they lie down on the cart i lie down on tracks and then boom they hear the train sound and they get up another day <laughs> <laughs> so at one level it requires courage to end one's life so that's it's courage but if one is ending one's life because of frustration because of not having the spine to deal with life's problems then that is cowardice that's why it is courageous cowardice <coughs> so similarly here there is a there is a oxymoron this is a nath means master and gopala bala gopala bala means a child a cowherd boy Now normally the idea of a master would mean somebody who's like a wealthy merchant or a powerful king, but he is saying you are my master and you are a cowherd boy. Well, maybe at least a cowherd king or a cowherd leader could be a master. How can somebody who is just a mere boy and that too not a very not is a cowherd boy? How is he the nant? So he is saying this form of the Lord. of you who are the supreme master who has become a cowherd boy vapurnath gopala bala now why is it that krishna takes the form of a cowherd boy so krishna is the all attractive supreme lord but he desires the reciprocation of love and for the reciprocation of love whatever is required he does that so just like talked about the boxer earlier the champion boxer might just act as if he is playing with a child and get knocked down by the child why because he wants to reciprocate love so krishna is supreme but the infinite becomes finite so that he can reciprocate love with other finite beings if god comes in an infinite form how do you develop a personal relationship if you say god is infinite like the sky somebody might say oh i love the sky but what do you do with that love how do you express it practically you can look in admiration at the sky but that's about it admiration and awe but beyond that there's not much we can do so here a krishna although he is god he takes the form of a small cowherd boy and this is leela leela means that god conceals his divinity it's leela is like a play or a pastime that krishna conceals his divinity so that love can go forward unimpeded if you're constantly conscious how oh, this person is so great then we can't reciprocate with him if if says we know somebody is maybe a very powerful person the president of america or or the head of the army head of the police and then we can't really deal in a very friendly way with them because no oh, they may if we constantly constantly remember their position will be fearful but so krishna doesn't want that fear so he conceals his divinity and this he takes the form of a small boy now why a cowherd boy he takes the form of a small boy so that those devotees who want to reciprocate love with him as a, as a parent they can be facilitated So the normal idea is God is the parent and we are the children, but God wants to reciprocate all the flavors of relationships that we that we relish in the world. So we have a relationship with the parent, we have relationship with children, we have children relationship with friends, we have siblings. So God wants the full gamut of relationships, and thus He takes the role of a small child. and he now why a cowherd boy we can understand as a boy because he wants to facilitate love by concealing his divinity but why a cowherd boy because krishna loves cows now say so why does krishna love cows well krishna is a person and a person means person has preferences person has likes so krishna Now, now we could say cows are so sim so simple, so sweet, so sublime. They are like mothers, and they give milk. All that is true. And 
won't let Krishna as a person. He has his choice. So he loves cows because cows are so lovable. So and he does the role of a cowherd boy. So he models how God in his abode doesn't delight in opulence. He delights in simplicity. He delights in the uh, he delights in proximity to nature. So he is a cowherd boy. So he's saying this form of yours as a cowherd boy. And not as a cowherd boy, he has described that form as that form will be described further in the next verse. But what does he say? Idam te vapurnatha gopala balam sadame. Let it always be. Manasya avirashtam. That let it always be manifest in my heart. And let my mind and heart be filled with the remembrance of that. Kim Anyai. What else can I desire? What else is worth the desire? I simply want to remember you, oh Lord. This is a very elevated prayer. At the same time, it is not that difficult to understand. We have four basic needs in life. We need food, we need water, we need air, and we need someone to blame. <laughs> oh, because what happens, these necessities, even if we get them, they don't satisfy us. And we are not satisfied, then I need someone to blame. Why am I not satisfied? <laughs> We actually, we have physical needs, they are important, but we need something more. See, there has been many studies which correlated, which are correlated say, now physical needs, we can say that they are fulfilled when we have money. So there are many studies which are correlated, which are trying to study the relationship between wealth and happiness. And it's interesting, if we consider wealth, uh, happiness and the y-axis, we have a graph happiness on the y-axis and uh, wealth on the x-axis. Then, st many studies have found that there is a straight correlation. As your wealth increases, your happiness increases. Is that true? No. Yes, it is true. But only up to a particular point. If a person's basic needs are not being met, if a person doesn't have food, if a person doesn't have a place to stay, then if, if somebody is hungry and then they get, get some money, it's, it's great joy, it's great relief. So up to, a, up to a particular point where people's basic needs are not met, uh, wealth is proportional to happiness. But beyond that, what, how much money we are making doesn't make, determine our happiness. What we are making with money determines our happiness. Once you have money, what are you doing with it? What are the values by which you are living? What are the purposes for which one is living? That determines happiness. So, we, we all need, at a, fun, at a physical level, we have certain needs and they are important. They, they, they need to be dealt with. But beyond that, what we most fundamentally need is a satisfying object of thought. We need a satisfying object of thought. If we, okay, something I think about which will make me peaceful, which will make me joyful. And this need today is so great. And that need is not being fulfilled. Well, in the past when society, maybe in, a, maybe in 20, 30 or 50 years ago, when the society was more structured, people had their family, people had their social circles, People had their, their, their place in, in the world and that gave them some satisfaction. But today, all those, some of those structures are falling. I was in New Zealand about 4-5 months ago and I often, in my, when I give seminars to new people especially, I talk about how social fabric is falling apart. And one of the sad things I talk about is how, you know, it says the divorce rates are increasing. So the devotees in New Zealand told me, don't quote this. 
I said, why? Do people get offended by that? He said, no, because it, no, it's not true. Oh, really? He said, divorce rates are not increasing? He says, yes. Why? Because marriage rates are decreasing. <laughs> <laughs> So people just find marriage too entangling, so just live together. And so the point is that there is no satisfaction that when if somebody has some place where they call can call us home, then there is some satisfying object of thought. Of course, and now even in, even at home there can be conflicts, and there's not a very satisfying object of thought always. But at least some satisfying object of thought is there. But when the structures that bring order to people's life they are disrupted, then the mind has no place to call as home. And the mind becomes very restless. And that is why, because the mind needs some satisfying object of thought, that's why today, entertainment has become such an obsessive thing for people. Entertainment has always been a part of human society. But today, it is obsessive. There are People spend millions and millions of uh, dollars on just entertainment. If, if, say, a thousand years later, if somebody wanted to study the 21st century and they wanted to know what is a typical artifact of the 21st century, so probably one of the most characteristic artifacts would be movies. Uh, so many movies are produced and millions of dollars. So many and so expensive. Why? Because people need some satisfying object of thought. And that, okay, somehow just turn on some TV, turn on your phone, get on the internet and just watch and forget about the emptiness of life. So this need, it cannot be denied. But entertainment is basically like a pain medication. It doesn't really satisfy us. Like when you take pain medication, it covers the pain. It doesn't cure the pain. So similarly, entertainment, what it does is, it just numbs us to the emptiness of our life. And after that, again, we want more entertainment. Maybe more, more intrusive, more aggressive, uh, more explicit entertainment. Because that is not really addressing the issue. So the most satisfying object of thought is Krishna. Krishna is unlimited. He is he is unlimited. He is unlimitedly attractive, and he is unlimitedly satisfying. So when he's being is praying over here, manasya virashtam kimanye sadame man. Let this form always remain in my heart. Let me always think about it. So this is actually the highest, this is the desire that can bring the greatest happiness. I started by saying about how we we can desire, various, we all desire happiness and we may desire different sources of happiness. The greater the source of happiness, the greater happiness we will get. So why is Krishna the greatest source of happiness? Because if we become, if we can become habituated thinking about Krishna, then we can think about him forever. He has unlimited pastimes. Each of those pastimes has unlimited depth. And in thinking about him, we will never tire. We will always have that ecstatic satisfaction. One of the last lines of this Ashtakam is that Namo Ananta Leelaya Devaya Tumbhim. Ananta Leelaya. My dear Lord, you perform unlimited pastimes. And I just want to absorb myself in them. So here, Satyavatmami is praying, My dear Lord, let me become absorbed in you. Let my mind become attached to you. This is the prayer that will bring the richest reward for us. The reward of, if our mind becomes attached to him, the Lord manifests always in our hearts. Then we will always be satisfied. And life will always have its ups and downs. But if you are internally strengthened, if you are internally enriched, then life's problems, life's disturbances won't disturb us that much. Remember, I'll conclude with this example. Remembrance of the Lord 
is or absorption of our consciousness in the lord is like an unsinkable ship the world we live in is like a stormy ocean and the stormy ocean we can't stop stormy waves from coming sometimes the ocean might be peaceful but soon it will become stormy so if we think that my life will become comfortable and then i will become happy yes that we can try that but it will be futile yes we can maybe increase our comfort to some level but more important than trying to find a peaceful place in the ocean is to find a ship and get into that ship so similarly for us we may try to create maybe get a better job get a better house get a, improve our relationships all these things are important but they are all like trying to find a more peaceful place in the ocean what we need to do most importantly is get into the ship and absorption in krishna is like an unsinkable ship if we can get into that ship then life storms even if they even if they hit us they won't hurt us that much and when we try to practice our bhakti if we're practicing our bhakti if we expect god to give us a stormless sea we will soon be disappointed and anyway, we start thinking does god even care for me i am praying and nothing is happening but instead of that yes when storms are there we can actually we don't nobody wants storms and we can pray for the storms to go away but we don't base our relationship with the lord on his removing the storms from our life we base our relationship with him on getting into that unsinkable ship so whatever problems we have if we pray my dear lord let my consciousness become attached to you let my consciousness become absorbed in you then even if there is no release from problems we will still experience relief amidst problems release for problems is when the storm goes away relief amid problem is when we ascend into the ship the unsinkable 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 ship that is krishna consciousness that is absorption in krishna so that is what we all aspire to do by coming in the association of devotees and practicing sadhana bhakti every day that we try to practice sadhana bhakti we are making our mind more and more attached to krishna initially bhakti has to be practiced conscientiously yes our mind may go here there everywhere we bring it back to krishna but if we keep doing that as we practice conscientious bhakti gradually it will start becoming spontaneous the devotion that is conscientious now will become spontaneous and when it gradually becomes spontaneous then we can be joyfully absorbed in krishna and when we are just joyfully absorbed in krishna then we will be able to weather all of life storms and the ship of absorption in krishna will ultimately take us to destination krishna to krishna's eternal abode which is forever free from all storms and namo rashtakam reminds us of this destiny that awaits all of us that beckons all of us and toward which we can advance with every single day with every act of bhakti that we do we are progressing toward our eternal goal so i'll summarize what i spoke today i spoke on the topic of what understanding the lord as the supreme desirable based on this fourth verse of damodar ashtakam uh, we don't start suddenly thinking about god one day when we function in the world and are not able to get what we desire then we think that maybe god will be the source of the desire that's when we start thinking about god and it's good to think about god in any way but at that time we are interested not in god but in what god gives and that is a preliminary relationship with god a more advanced relationship is when we become interested in god and we become interested in god when we understand how interesting and fascinating and endearing a person he is and that is revealed in the bhakti tradition that god does not delight in his godhood but he delights in the reciprocation of love and thus he conceals his godhood so that he can enjoy a rich gamut of relationships 
with his devotees. So the infinite becomes finite. So God's understanding God's greatness brings submission. Understanding God's sweetness brings affection. And submission and affection both combined are serious devotion or committed devotion. And I talked about how here Tevat Muni is praying God is the giver of benedictions. He doesn't ask for any of the benedictions that people ask for. Give me so many desirable things. Because he is I mean, he's a sage and sages are limited to enough to understand that getting desirables is not as desirable as getting freedom from desire. So that is the state of liberation. But even the desire for liberation is also a desire. You cannot be free from desires and it is based on a misdiagnosis. Thinking that desires are the cause of problem whereas it is the misdirected desire that are the cause of problem. Pain is caused not by motion but by disease. So then what is beyond the state of desirelessness of liberation is the spiritual world. That's the negative axis and the positive axis. But he says I don't want to go to the spiritual world also. Why? Because going to the spiritual world is not just a matter of physical relocation. It is a matter of emotional redirection. That we need to direct our heart from the world to the Lord. And to do that we need to become attracted to the Lord. And if that Lord is present here, then what is the need to go there? So I just want to behold you, O Lord. And there I talked about how in the, uh, that we may desire many things in the world and when we desire those things, there are things which are needed for our existence. But beyond that, our mind tends to grumble. We need someone to blame. Because the mind never finds a satisfying object of thought. And that's why entertainment is manically pursued by people. Because the structures that provided people some peace in their lives in the past, they have also been rapidly dismantled in today's world. So the supreme satisfying object of thought is Krishna. If we can develop our devotion to him, then we can be satisfied wherever he may be. And life, like being, being in this world is like being in a stormy ocean. We can't stop the storms and expecting God to stop the storms is an unrealistic expectation. But what we can do is get into the ship, the unsinkable ship of absorption in the Lord. And that ship can not only shelter us amid the storms of the world, but it can also take us to the shelter beyond the stormy ocean of the world. So by practicing conscientious devotion, we can experience relief amid distress, even if we don't experience release from distress. And gradually, as that conscientious devotion becomes spontaneous, we can become joyful even in this world and ultimately attain Krishna beyond this world. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare. Any questions or comments? Yes. We have been talking about liberation, about moksha, and uh, that we have to redirect our desires from the material to spiritual. But uh, sometimes we can experience that the cause of those desires can be not the desire itself, but the sinner. Or um, sometimes we have desires, and then after that, the can have a fear to lose something or what we desired before. And then in the future, if we're going to practice our spiritual path, <clears throat> this fear uh, we can also experience in the spiritual life. That like I'm chanting for 20 years, I'm doing this, this and this, I'm serving Krishna all my life, <clears throat> but maybe there is not that much advancement that I want in my life. Or, and we have fear that we're never going to reach our destination. So by the redirecting our uh, desires, are we going to get rid of the fear? Okay. So by redirecting our desires toward Krishna, will we become free from fear? We may even have fears that I will never become purified, I may never attain Krishna. Again, fear in spiritual life also. The We could say that desire and fear are two sides of the same coin. Wherever there will be desire, there will be fear. For example, Yashoda Mai, Mother Yashoda, she is very fearful. 
If I don't feed Krishna, he will starve. He may die. When Krishna becomes too naughty, she wants to discipline him because our Acharya has described, she is afraid that if, the reputa- if this Krishna gets this reputation that he is naughty, he steals and he is a thief, then Krishna is just a small baby right now, but Mother Yashoda is having fear. If Krishna develops his reputation, then when he grows up, who will give their daughter in marriage to him? <laughs> so, who will marry him? So, now, wherever there is love, fear is a part of it. But, that what does that fear do? That fear increases her absorption in Krishna. So, fear itself is not a bad thing. It ultimately, as I said, the negative axis and the positive axis, if we consider, in the positive axis, there is the full gamut of relationship with Krishna. And it is... We could say forgetfulness of Krishna is is for the soul poison. And remembrance of Krishna is like nectar. However, you can have sweet poison and you can have bitter nectar. (laughs) So, sometimes forgetfulness of Krishna can seem very enjoyable. Especially if you get a lot of worldly things to enjoy. Yeah, this is this is wonderful. I want this, but that sweet, the sweet poison is only sweet for a short time. Yet that agre amruto pamam parina me vishami ba. In 1838, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says that which tastes like nectar in the beginning will be like poison in the end. So conversely, with respect to Krishna, remembrance of Krishna is always like nectar. But when that remembrance of Krishna is with Krishna present in front of us and Krishna reciprocating love with us, that's like sweet nectar. But when there is uncertainty whether, whether about the safety of Krishna, about the reciprocation of Krishna, then there's anxiety. But that anxiety is like bitter nectar. It is nectar only. Why? Because we are thinking about Krishna. And thinking about Krishna is always auspicious. So, as devotees, if we want to be only free from fear, then where is the scope for a service over there? Srila Prabhupada, when he was in Vrindavan, he was living peacefully. He was visiting the various temples, chanting the holy names. He was writing the Bhagavatam commentaries. When he came to America, there was anxiety. But he took that anxiety for the service of Krishna. So for each of us, should we strive to be free from fear? It's not that we court fear, obviously not. But our purpose is not simply to be free from fear. Our purpose is to serve Krishna. And for serving Krishna, if sometimes some planning is required, some anticipating of future problems and dealing with those problems is required, that simply indicates our seriousness about how we want to serve him. So, yes, we could say even fear can sometimes go beyond manageable limits. Yeah. It means that all of us, when we take responsibility, see, whenever there is responsibility, there is anxiety. Because that's natural. Responsibility brings anxiety with it. But there is responsibility that is manageable and there is responsibility that is unmanageable. If if somebody tells me to give a class on the Bhagavad Gita or the Bhagavatam, well, I can do that because I've studied those books. But if somebody tells me to give a class on, say, the fluid mechanics used in satellites, well, maybe I studied that 25 years ago. I don't remember anything. That will cause anxiety. So we have to see whenever we are in a particular situation, are we taking up, are we biting more than what we can chew? Then if that is happening, then we downsize a little bit. So we need to have fear that is manageable. We don't simply try to avoid fear, nor do we try to embrace fear. We focus on our purpose and we pursue that purpose to the extent that uh, that is manageable for us. So we, if we do it that way, then even the fear will intensify our devotion. And as far as the fear whether we are advancing or not, whether we will advance or not, 
we need to manage that intelligently so if we start feeling discouraged then we need to turn and look back we can look back at how far we have come and each one of us we will see that if we been practicing bhakti for a few years our life has changed see to to understand to assess spiritual advancement also we have to be careful that sometimes we look at our desires and our emotions that oh, i still feel angry i still feel envious i feel still feel this feel that but am i really advancing that our desires and our emotions are are very flickering and we can't base our assessment of our spiritual advancement on our feelings our emotions our desires then what do we base it on on our values have our values changed in the past maybe uh, if maybe worldly desires started increasing within me i would think that if somebody say has desires and then they say oh yes i i want more i want to be angry i want to yell at others i want to control them i want to dominate them but now when i get angry i don't want to be angry i want to fight it i want to restrain it so if you look at change of values that has definitely happened change of values means basically what do we value now the most each one of us we value we are well we may not constantly value krishna the most but overall if you have to make life choices krishna will definitely be an important priority for us so uh, if you look at change of values we will see there is advancement we can't judge our uh, spiritual advancement on a day to day basis or a moment to moment basis that's too uh, too fickle uh, parameter just like if small babies are there some small children they don't eat food and their mother tells them you know you take this milk or you take this take this healthy food and then you become strong and muscular and when the child drinks one full glass of milk and then measures the biceps i not become <laughs> i not become muscular what is this you are lying no the mother is not lying but the growth is gradual so similarly we need to look at our own spiritual advancement in a gradual way in terms of seeing what is it that we value and we will see that we are advancing that don't just base it too much on the emotions or the fee- desires that we that keep coming and going now answer your question thank you yes madam yes madam so if you say bad karma good karma so what is good karma to me may be a bad karma to others and they also say a thought itself is a karma so when you are talking about a thought how powerful it is we need a satisfying thought that's why we need to think about krishna so we have a satisfying thought so that itself is a karma okay okay so is satisfying uh, thought also is a karma and then is thinking about krishna also karma if we need a satisfying object of thought well let's look at what we mean by the word karma first of all the idea behind karma is that we are responsible for our actions we all live in a whole bigger than ourselves for example we we drive on a road, drive a car on a road then we are participating in a whole that is a road transport system that is bigger than ourselves and if we are participating in that whole we need to play our part properly we need to follow the rules if we don't follow the rules while driving then we endanger ourselves and we endanger others sometimes when that, that particular time maybe some cops are not there we might get away for some time but eventually we'll get caught so we could say karma is like traffic rules we live in a world which is far bigger than ourselves and we need to play our part harmoniously so if we follow the rules then we can get to our destination if not so simple that we create problems for ourselves so bad karma is when we live in a disruptive way when we live in a disruptive way that is bad karma so now good and bad they can have multiple meanings when specifically we use the word good and bad karma in the bhakti context what it means is if we 
seek good results at the material level that is what is related with good karma uh, what good karma will give us good material results bad karma will give bad material results say somebody is thirsty and we give them a glass of water and we quench their thirst then that is good karma and the result of that could be in our future lives you know we are born in a place where we will never have water shortage it's 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 a very simplified understanding but say but that, that's the principle say if somebody is very thirsty and they want to drink a glass of water and we maliciously knock off that water from their hands that's, so that's bad karma so now then that will maybe we are born in a place where a lot of water shortage and we have to we experience the agony of thirst uh, repeatedly over there so now beyond this beyond this good karma and bad karma it's ultimately if we try to raise our consciousness to the spiritual level then that is called as there is uh, there is you could say su karma v karma and a karma a karma is not not in action a karma is action that produces no material reaction so when we try to practice bhakti and increase our devotion to krishna we are practicing a karma so that is not going to bind us that is not that is not going to bind us in any positive or negative way that elevates and liberates us okay thank you then you want last yes hari krishna so um sorry but the question is yeah i want to say tell it to anybody but i i was explaining a kid um that um krishna is the king of reality and the gun is written in bhagavad gita and the shloka and so she questioned me like what if if somebody just wrote it as a fiction novel or something how do you prove that these grunts and the these are like for real like how do you prove like krishna is supreme like what do you answer how do you answer that to a kid okay good question so how do we prove to a kid that krishna is supreme there are different kinds of proofs say if i tell you that the temperature in india right now is 35 degrees celsius in mumbai now you can go and google and check or you can call somebody in india and you can check that there are more there are objective ways to check that but if if i ask you did your mother love you yes of course what is the proof and now you cannot give a scientific proof of that with all our scientific advancement i talk about how i have a whole seminar on science and spirituality i talk about science is the study of matter and spirituality is the study of what matters hmm? <laughs> what is it really important in life hmm? science can use immense amount of information but what is the information that is important for us that is spirituality studies so with all the advancement that we have in science and we can measure a person's heartbeat we can measure their platelets they get their rbc's wbc's we can measure many things but we don't have anything like a love meter <laughs> so how do you prove that your mother loves you the the proof of that is not a objective parameter that can be measured and verified there are different ways a different ways what is called as inferential logic we make inferences you know at that time when i was sick my mother stayed awake all night to take care of me at that time when i was i was in a big trouble because of another sickness and we need a lot of money mother was ready to sell all her ornaments just for getting that oh that time this 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 you can think probably of a dozen more than dozen maybe incidents from which we can infer that my mother love so there are different ways of proving different things so we can't have the same parameter of proof for everything now as far as krishna's divinity is concerned if we look at scripture as the source there can be different ways of doing this let's make it uh, let's make it two part first of all what the authority of scripture and then the divinity of krishna so as far as the authority of scripture is concerned now we uh, 
how do we know that they are not written by some some person in the past well we were not there in the past when they were written so we can't have that objective proof but what what do this what do they tell us basically we can uh, if we look at life around us our basic needs are provided for we have we need water we need air we need food we need light we need heat these are provided for now if some higher arrangement has provided us with the things we need to live with then one very important thing which we also need is knowledge this is what we live with and what we live for what is the purpose of life is somebody going to provide us that knowledge say if we are staying at a particular place and maybe we are not so well to do and then we don't have any means of transportation and suddenly we find right outside our house there's a there's a there's a elegant car and not only that car there are spare tires with it and there's a lot of spare fuel with it who can get this car if they went to all the trouble of giving me this car Maybe they'll give me a map. They'll give me some address. Where where am I meant to go? Isn't it? So if God uh, if God has provided us with the means to live, then God will also provide us the meaning of life. There is there is means without meaning is meaningless. Giving a car without any any map or destination. What is the, what's the purpose of the car? So we could reasonably say that. the knowledge about the purpose of living will be provided for and that is we could say something like a map or a guide book or a manual for operating a car for going to destination now if some book some ancient book wisdom text is said by some people to be the to be the guide book for life it's like a map for our travel now how do we know whether a particular book is a guide book hmm? how do we know if we have a device that this is the manual for the device it is basically by two things first the the manual helps us to make it it's sen- it's sensible and it's verifiable it helps us make better sense of the device oh this this button is this, this button is this so if if a map is for real it will describe oh this territory is called this 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 landmark is this, this landmark is this and then it is verifiable in the sense that if i use that manual the device works better similarly if i take a map and i drive a car i can go to okay it said i will come here this could you come here you come here you come here so basically if we look at scripture as a guide book provided by the divine for us to live then if we study the bhagavad gita for example we'll find does it help us to make better sense of life Yes, if we study the Bhagavad Gita, we'll find it does. And does living according to the Bhagavad Gita make our life better? Does it? So that way, it, this is not a, it's not a mathematically refutable proof, but it's a reasonable inference. Now, beyond that, the specific point about Krishna's divinity, if you're going to ask, the <clears throat> the Bhakti tradition gives us an objective definition of God. It says that um, some people ask that if God, if God created everything, who created God? Now that question sounds logical only as long as we don't understand the definition of God. The definition of God is He is the source of everything, the cause of all causes. That if if we trace back this 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 came from this, this came from this, this came from this, where does this stop? And wherever that stop, that is God. so if somebody asks who made god that's like asking who made a circle circular well nobody made a circle circular the circle is by definition circular but similarly if there were a maker of god the maker of god would be god so wherever that that chain stops that is god so now okay because if, okay maybe there is a there is a cause of all causes how do we know that is krishna so that is again it gives a objective description of god not just definition of cause of all causes but also description description is that 
God is the person who is all attractive. There are broadly six opulences, six attractive qualities. When we when we are attracted to someone, I mean because they are they are good looking, they are wealthy, they are intelligent, they are powerful, they are famous, and the six opulences, they are renounced. renounced. Now we say who is attracted to renounced people? <laughs> well. We may not be attracted to renunciation, but we are all attracted to the fruit of renunciation. The fruit of renunciation is peace. If somebody renounces their peace food, and whenever, whenever there are disturbing situations, and somebody says very calm and composed, everybody admires them. This person stays. This person is tough. They stay calm. So basically, these are the things we are attracted to. Any tradition, if you go to. No tradition, no religious tradition will say that my God is ugly. No tradition will say my God is a weakling. Hmm? So everybody says God is all powerful, all strong, all wise, all beautiful. So now this is, uh, these are the objective characteristics of God. Now is there a person who fits this bill? If somebody just walks into this room and they say, I am the president of America. I say, you know, did you come out of an institution? <laughs> we will, we will, we will probably not believe it. But if we find that they have the capacity, they can order the American army, the American navy. If they have those powers, they order and the army goes and attacks somebody or whatever. I say, okay, then maybe you are the president. So similar, so basically, there are the objective characteristics of God that are described, and then. The bhakti tradition offers us a person. Here is a person who is supremely beautiful, supremely wise, who is extraordinarily powerful. So here is the characteristics of a person, and here is the person who has those characteristics. So that's how we can say this is this is at the very least again from inference we can say this is a reasonable inference to say that this is the divine. And Shri Prabhupada would often say that. you talk with people from other traditions and you say that if you have a better conception of divinity then tell us about it but most of the traditions all the real all traditions talk about love of god but very few traditions actually describe how god is lovable the personal description of god is not there so in that way through a chain of inferences we can talk about krishna's divinity now how you will explain this to your child is a challenge for you <laughs> but um, i think children are also often more intelligent than what we give them credit to so if you talk about this gradual inferential logic it's not that inaccessible okay thank you so thank you very much shri prabhupad ki jai gaur bhakt vrind ki jai hitai gaur premanande jai